I'm Mark Golub, and in the news is a rather startling op-ed piece that was given enormous prominence in the New York Times. Ian Lustig is a Jewish political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania who's known for bringing a decidedly far leftist perspective to the politics of the Middle East and also is known for his anti-Israel positions. On September 15th, the New York Times chose to publish a front page op-ed piece in its prestigious Sunday Review by Ian Lustig, a piece which the Times entitled Two State Illusion. In his op-ed piece, Professor Lustig argues that any possibility of a two-state solution has long since passed, dying with the failures of Oslo in the late 1990s. Lustig calls upon the United States to stop the charade of a two-state solution perpetrated by Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and by the American administration, and to support instead what Lustig argues is the only viable solution that will put an end to the immoral and unjust apartheid conditions Israel has created in all of the lands west of the Jordan River. In essence, Lustig is arguing for a one-state solution in which the Zionist state, Israel, shall cease to exist, with the entire lands west of the Jordan becoming a democratic confederation in which Arab and Jew will live in peace together. Well, Professor Lustig's New York T Times op-ed piece has evoked quite a bit of response within the Jewish community, and one of the responders is the executive director of the American Jewish Committee, David Harris, who joins us now on our phones. David, thank you for giving us a moment. My pleasure, Mark. First of all, David, I want to wish you a happy new year. This is the first time we're speaking since the holidays, and I hope this year is a Shana Tova Umitu Ka for you. Thank you, and the very same to you and to all the viewers of Shalom TV. Thank you. So, David, what's the fundamental quarrel you have with Ian Lustig's op-ed piece? Well, actually, the fundamental quarrel I have, Mark, is less with his piece, which um, I, I clearly um, oppose, and more with the New York Times for its decision to publish it. Uh, after all, uh, all of us who, uh, who, who write and who have submitted pieces to newspapers like the New York Times know very well that the newspaper is very selective about what it chooses to publish and, and what it chooses not to publish. And the fact that the paper not only chose to publish his piece, but to give it the extraordinary prominence which you mentioned a moment ago, uh, is really something that I've rarely seen in the paper. Now, mm -hmm. I've been reading the New York Times on a daily basis for about 50 years. That's half a century. And uh, I don't remember many such instances, especially in the review section, uh, where most of the front page, including massive artwork about 14 inches high, and most of two inside pages were devoted to an article, which at the end of the day calls, as you said uh, a moment ago, for the absurd outcome of a one-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. By the way, the last person um, that I recall advocating this in the New York Times was Muammar Gaddafi, uh, the, uh, the late leader of Libya, who also bizarrely was given space on the op-ed page of the Times to, um, to talk about something that, frankly, is a non-starter. So I don't agree at all with Lustig, uh, neither his analysis nor his conclusions, but to be fair, he's entitled to them, however reprehensible they may be to some others. Rather, I, I question what was going on in the minds of the New York Times editors that um, led them to the conclusion that this was something to be done, and done now, by the way, Mark, with everything that's happening in the Middle East, all of the mega-stories of Syria, of the new U.S.-Russian relationship, of the role of the United Nations um, in, in this chemical weapons uh, proposal, of what's been going on in Egypt, of, of, of what's going on in Iran and Turkey, of all of the issues to publish a piece not about Israeli-Palestinian prospects for peace per se, but rather um, uh, a, a very tendentious piece on a one-state solution. Why? And especially, why now? David, would you have felt it was more appropriate if there had been a responder appearing in the same uh, edition of the Times? And I was supposing they had also called you and said, here's what Lustig's about to say, we'd like to give you equal space. Would that have made you more comfortable? 
Well, again, uh, you know, I, I'm, as we as we speak now, Mark, I, I have the review in front of me, and uh, you know, I continue to be uh, <laughs> amazed at how much space uh, yes. would they have given a responder the same amount of space, the same <laughs> amount of artwork, the same amount of, in other words, eye-catching uh, place in the paper. But generally speaking, uh, I've learned over the years that that's not the way the paper operates. In any case, um, they don't normally present two sides of an issue, um, and I, I don't say this critically, it's simply stylistic, um, they, they instead invite letters to the editor. Uh, it, my reaction was not to wait for a letter, letter to the editor to the Times that may or may not be published, and that's usually limited to 200 words anyway, compared to what I can only guess must be at least 2,000 words here. Uh, but I wrote a piece for the Huffington Post and the Jerusalem Post, which is available on the AJC website, AJC.org, uh, which was my, you know, my thousand-word response um, to the New York Times' decision to public the, uh, publish the piece, as well as to a number of the things that Lustig said. And one of the particularly shocking things, which I think your viewers uh, will grasp as a sense of, 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 of the way he looks at the world, um, let me quote him. Um, he says, uh, in, in, in sort of trying to visualize this, you know, this, this halcyon one-state solution in which everyone... You know, it's essentially lives side by side happily ever after. Uh, he says Israelis whose families came from Arab countries might find new reasons to think of themselves not as quote Eastern, but think of them, but but rather as Arab. Now, in other words, he's asking um, up to half of the Israeli population, which comes from the Arab world or from countries like Iran to essentially reimagine and redefine themselves, not as Eastern, but as Arab. That's part of his vision, of his proposal. Now, I try this out. I'm lucky enough to be married to a woman who comes from an Arab country, in her case, Libya. And most of her family is in Israel, including several of her siblings and others. And I tried this idea out on all of them. And I must tell you, Mark, because we're in polite company here, I cannot, I cannot uh, repeat their response. Mm -hmm. But essentially their response was, as your viewers might imagine, uh, rather colorful, uh, <laughs> rather striking, uh, along the lines of, is he out of his mind? Mm -hmm. Does he fail to understand what our life was like as Jews in Arab countries to begin with? Why we fled in the first place? and why we were drawn by the magnet of Israel as a Jewish state. He wants us to redefine ourselves as Arab, and he wants the Zionist project for which we have all fought and dreamed for years and centuries to evaporate, to be replaced by his image of something that does not exist in the Middle East today, and there's no reason to believe that it would exist in his proposal either, uh, in a region surrounded by violence, where majority populations cannot accept minority populations calmly uh, or peacefully. He wants us to experiment because, because that's his project at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, no way, Jose. Mm -hmm. Or something a little bit less polite than that, Mark. I understand. In one moment, we'll deal with some of the substance of Lustig's argument. But let's come back to the, really the thrust of your own piece, which was brilliantly written. And again, people can read it on the AJ, uh, AJC website. Why do you think it was that the Times, in fact, did choose on the day after Yom Kippur to run this front page piece in the Sunday Review? You know, here, Mark, I, I have to confess, um, I'm clueless. I mean, I, I've gotten a lot of mail, and you know, there are all those people out there who are speculating um, about what the Times agenda is or might have been or was, but uh, to be honest with you, I don't know, uh, and I'd be very curious if Shalom TV could interview uh, the editors of the review section and try and understand why they believe that this piece, written in this way, uh, was worthy of publication with so much prominence, and especially at this moment in time, and I'll be the first viewer of that Shalom TV okay. show. We will try to follow up on that very idea, David. Um, you know that we are facing, and you've dealt with this extensively, we are dealing with an enormous 
BDS movement that is trying to discredit, undermine the legitimacy of the state of Israel. In his piece, Lustig uh, makes comparisons between the Israeli, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to things like the British-Irish conflict and other, uh, France and Algeria. It's interesting to me, David, no one ever suggested that the British-Irish problem be solved by Britain stopping to exist, or the French-Algerian problem be solved by France simply dissolving. And I wonder if you feel that in some way, whether it's conscious, unconscious, on purpose somehow, not on purpose, but still influenced by this growing attitude pervading aspects of our culture and certainly Europe of a, an attempt to delegitimize the state of Israel. And was the Times in some way contributing to that, again, either consciously or unconsciously? Again, I don't know if it was the intent of the New York Times to do so because nowhere else on their editorial page have they ever questioned Israel's right to exist, um, not at all. But even if it was not their intent, by, by giving such attention and prominence to this piece, in effect, the impression of some may be that the paper was validating the point of view. Mm -hmm. Because after all, a newspaper is human. There's, there's no science about it. Uh, editors have to make decisions about what to publish, where to place it, what headlines, what artwork, what prominence, and again, as I said earlier, and many pieces don't appear at all. So there's no obligation to publish a piece simply because, in this case, a professor uh, at my alma mater, Penn, wrote it. That's not good enough. So even if it was not the intent of the newspaper, the outcome may well be that it added a certain layer of legitimacy to those who call for the, the end of the state of Israel. And by the way, it's worth noting, Mark, there are today well over 190 member states of the United Nations. There is not a single other member state of the United Nations that is scrutinized for its very right to exist. Its policies may be scrutinized at times, but not its very birthright. Israel is the only country in the world, and you've seen it now in the New York Times in this piece on Sunday, whose very right to exist is called into question, and and the author essentially said, I think rather cavalierly, well, you know, Zionism came, Zionism will go. Mm -hmm. Those are my words, not his. But that that's the, the essence Absolutely. of what he's saying. Absolutely. So, so the foundational the foundational notion of the Jewish people, going back thousands of years, that there is this inextricable, unbreakable bond among three things a land, a people, and a faith. Um, has just been challenged by a professor in West Philadelphia with the um, cooperation of the New York Times, who essentially said, sorry, uh, if ever it was, it shall no longer be, it should no longer be. Um, and why? why? Why, of all the nations of the world, Israel? I believe, and AJC has long believed, Mark, we've spoken on other occasions, that a two-state solution is not easy to achieve. We know that. <laughs> um, it's not impossible to achieve. With political will on both sides, it's not impossible. Of course, there, there are endless challenges. But Lustig's view that, that there is no chance, and, and at various places in the article, he calls it um, a fantasy, a, a pretense. Uh, when, when speaking about a two-state solution, uh, sort of throwing it into the dustbin of history. Uh, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, does not accept that. The European Union does not accept that. The Prime Minister of Israel does not accept that. Some Arab leaders themselves have spoken about the two-state uh, solution. Uh, we continue to believe in it. We continue to believe it's possible with, with, with goodwill, with determination, with courage. It's possible. And so his very premise that there's no way this is going to happen. And it's a myth, it's a fantasy, it's an illusion, it's a pretense to even think about it, discuss it today in 2013, I think is fundamentally wrong. I have to add, though, Mark, that while he puts all of the responsibility on Israel, 
Uh, the fact of the matter is that, that, that the Palestinians themselves have had more than one opportunity to work with Israel to achieve that two-state agreement. It goes back to 1947 and 1948, and it fast-forwards to 2000, to 2001, to 2008, until the present. So, on the one hand, he, he, he essentially calls for the, the dissolution of Israel and the Zionist dream as we know it, but on the other hand, um, the Palestinians who've never been willing to go along with the two-state solution are, in a way, exempted from criticism for their failure to cooperate. So we pay the price at both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, Lustig argues that Israelis believe Israel will not endure. He says at one point, it's quite plausible for the disappearance of Israel as a Zionist project through war, cultural exhaustion, or demographic momentum, and argues that he hears Israelis all the time talk about simply when will Israel go out of existence. Have you heard Israelis talk that way? No, not in that way, and not in a way that I would declare that there is um, <laughs> the emergence of a view in Israel that now dominates. You know, Jews by nature, we're, we're, we're complainers. Uh, that, that, that's intrinsic to our nature. So do Jews worry? Do Israelis worry? Of course they worry. If we didn't worry, we wouldn't be Jews. We wouldn't be Israelis. But, you know, what's fascinating is, is to, to, to see the, the arc of these 65 years since Israel was established, and at how many points, and it would make a very interesting article, Mark, at, at how many points along those 65 years did people say, um, Israel won't survive, it can't survive, it can't survive precisely because of the demographic issue, because time is against it, because at some point the Arab armies will overwhelm and defeat Israel, because the internal divisions in Israel will ultimately lead to the um, dissolution of the state. I mean, I've heard those things by, by, by the hundreds, Mark, over the years. And you know what? They've all been wrong. Yes. Uh, oh, well, I... take, take Israel in 1948 and take Israel in 2013. 650,000 people, Mark, in 1948 over 8 million people in 2013, um, three-quarters of whom are Jewish, uh, a country that is now among the top uh, economic and industrial uh, giants of the world, for its size especially. Look at all of the indices. Uh, Israelis are the 11th happiest country in the world, according to the most recent sort of happiness index. Israelis have among the longest life expectancy in the world. Uh, Israel is among the leaders um, in startups on, on, on NASDAQ. I mean, in every place you look, Israel is booming and thriving. Are there the occasional concerns about the future? Of course there are. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be Israeli and Jewish if there weren't. But for Lustig to build sort of a theory about the inevitability of Israel's disappearance, um, to me, is, is absurd. Oh, I want you to come in on one more passage from his article where he writes... Secular Palestinian Arabs in Israel and on the West Bank could ally themselves with Tel Aviv's post-Zionist, non-Jewish, Russian-speaking immigrants, foreign workers, and global village Israeli entrepreneurs. First of all, David, who are the Tel Aviv post-Zionists? Yeah, again, I, I think that he's... Uh... I think that he's misreading I mean, Israel. What, what in the world is he writing about, David? He's misreading Israel in order to try and buttress his own theory. Um, but he's misreading the country that, Mark, you know, and I know, and other viewers of Shalom TV know very well. Um, Zionism retains a hold as the national ethos of the state of Israel among a clear majority of the Israeli people. It continues to be a magnet for people to come and to start new lives in Israel uh, and to believe in the importance and the necessity of a Jewish state that is at one and the same time a democratic state. And I think that Lustig, in trying to construct his theory, is sort of grasping here and there at, at anecdotes, at impressions, at um, you know, bits and pieces, but it's a house of cards. Yes. It, it's a house of cards. The reality is staring us in the face. Uh, One more. Anyone, anyone who visits Israel, Mark, you don't have to be a professor of political science at an Ivy League university. Anyone who visits Israel 
can see for herself or himself within an hour a day the resilience, the strength, the vitality of this country, and no one sees it going away anytime soon. Mark. Absolutely, and, and that's the overwhelming sense I get from speaking to Israeli after Israeli. There's no thought at all that the state of Israel is going anywhere. There are deep concerns about the nature of the state, the nature of how we will treat the Arabs who live inside Israel, how will we ultimately make a, some kind of resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and how do we continue to make Israel the best country it can possibly be for both its own citizens and for really the entire world. But nobody I ever talked to, David, expresses to me any question about the fact there is a state of Israel now and there will be one forever. I have one last question before I let you run. Lustig also suggests that members of Congress are genuinely frightened to speak out against the state of Israel, that somehow there is intimidation, whether it's from AIPAC or whether in some way the AJC has uh, somehow members of Congress in some kind of uh, stranglehold. To what extent do you believe that members of Congress now are shackled from expressing criticism of Israel that they would like to be able to express except for their worry about some kind of Jewish reprisal? Um, Mark, I, 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 you know, I've heard that for many years, and um, I, I just don't believe it. Um, first of all, there are any number of members of Congress who do express from time to time concern or criticism about the state of Israel. Um, and uh, what's stopping them? Uh, I, I think that the, the bigger issue, which, um, which critics don't like to accept, this goes back to people like Walter Mearsheimer and their, you know, their infamous book, The Israel Lobby. What, 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 what critics of Israel don't like to accept is the fact that the overwhelming majority of Americans, Americans, Jews and non-Jews alike, are supportive of the state of Israel. Uh, that doesn't mean they necessarily agree with each and every decision of each and every Israeli government any more than they would with each and every decision of the U.S. government. But they get the storyline. Mm -hmm. They identify with, with Israel's narrative. They understand the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And by the way, I think markets even more pronounced today as Americans look at the mess of the Middle East, exactly. the instability, the insecurity, the uncertainty, exactly. the unpredictability, there's one stable country that remains a steadfast friend and ally of the United States on whom we can count. And for Americans, that means something. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you ended that way. David, you do marvelous work for the Jewish community. You know how much I love you. I wish you kol tuv ha'atzlacha and a shana tova mituka, a wonderful sweet year. And I hope it's a year we get to speak with each other and be with each other very often. Alevai, may it only be. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Shalom TV. Thank you. The thoughts of David Harris, Executive Director of the American Jewish Committee, sharing his response to Ian Lustig's op-ed piece in the New York Times Sunday Review, in which Professor Lustig calls for the abandonment of a two-state solution and to the end of a Jewish state of Israel in favor of a one-state democratic confederation. For my part, I found Professor Lustig's piece intellectually dishonest and rife with wishful thinking that shows an abysmal lack of understanding of the Palestinian people, the Israeli people, and the Jewish people. And I know he's an esteemed professor at University of Pennsylvania. I still think he was way off base. And he is entitled to his opinion. And I would not want the New York Times to reject his piece out of hand. But wouldn't it have been much more interesting and surely more intellectually honest to have invited someone like a David Harris to prepare a counter argument with as much space and artwork. In an area in which there is so much public ignorance, and there is enormous ignorance of Middle East history, especially as it applies to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and a growing bias against Israel, that seriously distorts Israeli policy and the Israeli agenda. A real BDS movement, boycotts, divestment, sanctions, that seeks to undermine Israel's very existence 
as the one Jewish state in the world and a Jewish state which has an absolute right under international law to exist. And again, no one suggested that the British-Irish conflict should be resolved by Britons disappearing, or that the French-Algerian conflict be resolved by France's going out of existence. Lestig refers to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union may have dissolved into many Slavic nations, but no one suggested Russia should disappear. And he mentioned South Africa. South Africa has no historical symmetry with Israel or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And comparing Israel to South Africa is pure demagoguery without any intellectual or factual honesty. But in Lustig's view, Israel should cease to exist. And there should be no what he calls Zionist state, which really means Jewish state. For Lustig, the way to create peace between the Jordan and the Mediterranean is for Israel to go out of existence. It's mind-blowing, is it not? Outrageous, morally outrageous. Imagine someone suggesting any other sovereign state solve a dispute with an adversary by going out of existence. Anyway, the simple fact is that so many people, even American Jews, I dare say, do not know enough to see where Lustig's arguments fall of their own weight, which is why in this case, for me, the New York Times was irresponsible by failing to print an opposing op-ed piece in the same Sunday review. But those are my views. I'd love to know yours. Please be in touch with me, and we'll read some of your comments on Shalom TV. Please email me or write me. You can post on our Facebook wall, or you can tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. My thanks to Sloan Copeland, Serge Goldberg, and our producer for this edition of In the News, Alan Orich. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.